Hello, friends. Thank you so much for watching this recording of our weekly Bible study at St. Timothy. I want to first ask you to please like this video, subscribe. If you're not subscribed to our channel already, please do that so you can get a notification every time that we have a new video or new content available for you. And if you have any questions or reflections throughout the course of this study, please leave those in the comments below for others to see and so that your questions get answered. It's so wonderful to have you join us in this way, but would love to invite you and have you join us in person on Monday nights, every Monday at 7.30 in the Parish Hall at St. Timothy Catholic Church in Laguna Niguel. If you can't join us in person, that's fine, but we would love for you to come. All backgrounds, all levels of faith experience and experience with the Bible are welcome. So we do hope to see you there. And without further ado, enjoy this recording of our weekly Bible study at St. Timothy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this evening, this beautiful day, and this opportunity to come together as a community once again to dive into your word and to listen to the ways in which you are speaking words of courage, words of comfort, words of conviction to each of us. We pray tonight, Lord, that we would encounter you in some way, that we would be open to the movement of your Holy Spirit in us, and that you would guide this time of study as we are in sacred scripture. You are the word made flesh, and so every time we encounter the word, we encounter you. And so, Jesus, we pray that we would be open and ready to receive you and whatever you have in store for us. Bless each one of us in the ways we most need it. Bless us in the ways we need encouragement. Bless us in the ways that we are attached to earthly things, to our sinfulness, to our own pride. As tonight's gospel challenges us, help us to allow you to be Lord of everything in our lives. And so we lay this time at your feet. We ask that your will be done. And we pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome. We are in Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 37. And we're going to read through the end of the chapter, so to verse 42, five or six verses. So if you would uh, open to that section of Matthew, you can go to Matthew 11 and then just look back a few verses. So uh, Matthew 10 is the end of the missionary discourse of Jesus. Okay, so in the Gospel of Matthew, which we are in for cycle A uh, this year, we are uh, looking at the, the Gospel of Matthew and it's good to have an understanding of its structure. So the structure of Matthew is in five main sections. The first section is the Sermon on the Mount, the main teaching of Jesus. And then the second main teaching section is called the Missionary Discourse, where Jesus is talking about what it means to go out. And so we've been reading from this for a few weeks. This is the very end of that discourse. Okay, so this is kind of a climactic high point of what Jesus wants to offer the apostles and by extension, all of us as disciples. This is what it means to go out and be missionaries. This is what it means to live your life out as disciples of Jesus Christ. So uh, that is what we have in store. It begins with the conditions of discipleship in Matthew 10. We're going to start in verse 37. There's first time through, just listen for what is being said. Jesus is teaching here in the region of Galilee uh, to his disciples. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever receives a righteous man because he is righteous will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives only a cup of water to one of these little ones to drink because he is a disciple, amen, I say to you, he will surely not lose his reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So there you get a kind of sense for what Jesus is teaching his disciples. The second time through, as we read this again, I want you to listen very particularly to the words as they are read. See if anything stands out to you, any detail resonates with you for any particular reason. Maybe it 
sparks a memory, a thought, it uh, aligns with something you've been praying for. It doesn't have to be to theologically interpret the passage, but just to see how is the Lord speaking to you through these specific words of this passage tonight. So listen carefully for that as we read this second time through Matthew 10, 37. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones to drink because he is a disciple, amen, I say to you, he will surely not lose his reward. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to look back over the passage, uh, especially the things that stood out to you, as well as any questions that this reading poses for you. Take about the next 10 minutes uh, at your tables to discuss those things. If you're at a smaller table, feel free to join another and uh, discuss with those around you what stood out to you and why, what questions do you have about this reading, and then we'll bring it back to the larger group after about 10 minutes. So go ahead and take that time. So, what are some of the things that are resonating with you from this passage, things that you have questions about or that are standing out to you? Jared? When it mentions the process reward, what is that reward? So, a prophet's reward, and there's several rewards kind of listed here, they're all seemingly, based on the context, synonymous meaning that they are, uh, they're all pointing at the fact that the reward of the prophet or the righteous man or the one that does a kind deed to a disciple is uh, receiving the reward of eternal life for the kingdom of heaven. So those people who are righteous, who are disciples, who are prophets, they're pursuing the truth, they're preaching in the name of Jesus. And so hopefully, if they're doing that faithfully, their reward is the kingdom of heaven. And so if you are, by extension, giving extending hospitality to those people, Jesus is saying here, you are um, making that reward, that blessing, more possible for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, one more. Yeah, um, when it mentions little ones, is that supposed to be like kids? That's a great question. So if you look at the context very carefully here, it's easy to think that this is, is talking about children. But if you read the whole verse, to one of these little ones to drink because he is a disciple, so the little ones is a word that is used, and it's more clear in the Greek, in the original Greek. Little ones is a term used for the disciples themselves, not for children. Because a child wouldn't necessarily be given that characterization as someone who has taken that upon themselves to follow a rabbi and formally study. A child would be someone much younger. Um, adulthood was, was younger at this time. It started in like your teenage years. But still, they would not be called children if they were formally under the tutelage of a rabbi, if they were officially his disciple. So uh, a little one is more meant to be a means of humbling. You know, like this is not about you and your own greatness. Uh, so these things that people are going to do for you, the hospitality they are going to extend to you is not because of you. Is not something like I think somewhere it's um, I hate it when people say this, but I can't think of the citation off the top of my head. So somewhere in the Bible, um, Paul writes, um, you know, I, I preach the gospel at no cost or at cost to no one. And so that's the thing that we are challenged to do. We don't do this for profit. Um, we don't do it for personal gain. And you can see based on the early church, the, the apostles and the early disciples, the only thing that they gained was death and very horrific, gruesome deaths as martyrs most often. Um, and if not that, then torture, persecution, people pursuing them, trying to end their lives. And this was consistent for the first 300 years of the entire church. Today, on the other hand, you see people who are in figure, figures of, um, or people who are in positions of power in certain uh, aspects of Christianity or in certain denominations, and even within Catholicism as well, who might extend that influence or that power to the point where they're gaining personal uh, you know, benefit, where they're gaining money, they're living in lavish mansions and flying private jets, 
And there are still people who are poor who that very denomination has promised to serve, and yet those funds are going elsewhere. And so this is a warning against that. This is a warning against uh, any, anyone who would seek to live out their discipleship for personal gain. Because then you're not being a disciple of Jesus. You're worshiping the false idol of yourself. And that's the opposite of being a disciple. And you see that very clearly in the first section of this. Because Jesus lays out what are the conditions of discipleship. It's the, the heading of that section. And I think T.S. Eliot put it really well. He says, um, Christianity is a condition of complete simplicity, costing no less than everything. So that's it. That's all it costs, all of it, everything, 100%. And if you just pay that nominal fee <laughs> of everything in your life and you hand it over to the Lord, that's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be a disciple, no less than everything. And if we're holding on to certain things, that's what Jesus is warning against here. In fact, this ends up in the catechism of the Catholic Church. There's a whole paragraph about this in 2232 in the catechism on the family and the kingdom. And it says this, this is what the, the church teaches. Family ties are important, but not absolute. Just as the child grows to maturity and human and spiritual autonomy, so his unique vocation, which comes from God, asserts itself more clearly and forcefully. Parents should respect this call and encourage their children to follow it. They must be convinced that the first vocation of the Christian is to follow Jesus. And then it refers to this passage here, quotes it directly. The first vocation of the Christian is to follow Jesus. Yes, as we're being raised, we physically follow after our parents. We try and emulate them, emulate our brothers and sisters. But ultimately, their job, our job as parents, siblings, is to influence others by saying, you're not following me. You know, and, and this isn't about me. I'm following Jesus, and so by extension, you are too. So the entire kind of harmony of all of our lives is oriented toward the kingdom, oriented toward following Jesus. That way, it doesn't become about any one person other than the person, God. Otherwise, we're inserting ourselves where we do not belong. What other things stand out? What other questions do you have? Yes, sir. Uh, we were talking about... Um... Verse 38, whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me. Yes. This is the first time he's mentioning his, his own demise to his disciples. To his disciples or... Yes, yeah. So in the Gospel of Matthew, this is the first time that phrase appears, take up your cross. First reference to it. Uh, in fact, that would have been a very... Um, kind of very odd turn of phrase. We've heard this passage many times. We know the end of the story. We have crucifixes in all of our churches. So it's not odd to us to hear this phrase, like take up your cross, right? But at this point, you know, in history, when this is being written, and especially during the lifetime of Jesus, when he actually said this before he was crucified, the cross was like the ultimate symbol of torture and execution. It was a symbol of humiliation especially because you are publicly executed as a, an example for all in, a, in the most painful, bloody, and horrific way possible. The Romans had perfected crucifixion over the 200 years previous to this and had gotten particularly good at making it as excruciating as possible. That's where that word comes from. It means excruce, from the cross. So painful that they had to invent a new word for how painful it was being associated with the cross. And so for Jesus to say, take up your cross... It's not about take up your coins and take up your power and your influence and your money and your popularity and all your followers on Instagram. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying take up your instrument of torture, of capital punishment, of complete deprivation and humiliation. And the apostles would have heard that and been like, what is he talking about? Like, why is someone encouraging and potentially even glorifying this horrific symbol? What does that mean? And that's why there's so many instances in the gospel where Jesus directly tells the apostles, this is what is going to happen to me. And it's just like, whoo, they're like, do not get it. They're just like, you know, James and John then respond in one of the, in one of the gospels. Uh, Can we sit at your right and your left? Like, we want all the power and the glory. And Jesus is like, are you kidding? Did you not hear what I just said? Like, this is not prepared for you. Like, do you, are you prepared to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And they're like, yeah, we can do it. You know, it's just like a bunch of dudes together. This is that, like, I love that passage. Because it's just like, do you think you can drink? Yeah, we can. Like, come on. We'll be there. Totally. Anytime. Anytime, any place. We'll be there for you, Jesus. It's like such a bro moment. Um, but they don't understand, right? And when Jesus is crucified, is it James and John at his left and his right? 
No, it's Cosmos and or not Cosmos and Damien, uh, Gestus and Dismas, the good thief and the, the bad thief. Two people who are also publicly humiliated for their actual crimes, not innocent, but condemned, and Jesus in the center of them. Innocent, but taking upon the punishment and the atonement for all of our sins. And so this would have been a very difficult passage to hear. Not only is Jesus saying, you can have no attachment to your family, no attachment to earthly things. doesn't mean those things are bad, but it means there is a priority in our life. And only one thing can be the priority. Okay, the word priorities did not exist 100 years ago. We invented it because we just got busier and we couldn't choose. Priority is... Prior means one. Only one thing can be prior to everything else. Okay, so you can only have one priority. And for us as disciples, that has to be the Lord. It costs no less than everything. Nothing else can sit on the throne of our hearts and fully satisfy all the desires that we have. Otherwise, it will, will be left unfulfilled, unsatisfied. Only Jesus belongs in that first position. So I have to, I con I'm constantly trying to, to get this kind of in my daughter's mind because she's always, you know, wants her dad's attention. I love my daughter, obviously, but I want her to understand, like if she's coming at me and I'm in the middle of, you know, talking to my wife or something like that, or if she's asking me, she has this kind of, you know, like all children do, like, daddy, can I marry you one day? And I'm like, this is not how this works. You know, it's very sweet, but it's just like, you know, so I have to constantly remind her in different contexts or for different reasons. Like, honey, it's, God is first in my life then your mom, and then you and your brother. And that's how it's always going to be. And then she'll try. She's trying to understand. She's like, well, is it God? And then mommy, me, and Levi tied for a second. I'm like, no, that's not how it works. You know, like, God, my covenant of marriage with your mother, and you and your brother are, will always be tied and equal at, at third. And she, like, will, will accept it, but then eventually it will come back. She's always trying to negotiate herself higher. Always. You know? And, and she's doing it in an innocent way, but the world is always trying to negotiate itself higher on our list of priorities, right? It's always trying to take that, that first place, you know? Like every ad campaign, every marketing slogan is not like, you know, we want you sometimes maybe once a year to think about this product and maybe buy it. It's like, no, this product needs to be your whole life, and if it is, it will change everything. Like that's how every marketing campaign is slated to us because everything is competing for that first position. Everything. Only Jesus truly belongs in that position. Yes? How old is your daughter? Uh, my daughter turns five in uh, a week and a half. Yeah, on July, or maybe two weeks, July 9th. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's very cute. Is she asking for a cell phone yet? No, no. But she did the other day, she, there was a misunderstanding. She went up to Bob because she's Bob's biggest fan, our music director here. And my wife was not like paying attention to what she was saying to Bob. And she went up to Bob and she was like, I'm sad. And he's like, oh, what's wrong? And she said, she said, my papa died. Who's my wife's dad? Who is not dead at all. <laughs> and, 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 but he was sick and he wasn't there that weekend at mass. So my mother-in-law was there, my wife was there, I was gone. And so Bob is like, is, is Eric dead? Like, is Matt's father-in-law really dead? They don't seem that upset, but Hannah just told me. And it turned out she was, like, thinking about my wife's papa, who's her great-grandpa, who died, like, two years ago. But for some reason, it got brought up in conversation. But she just, I don't know why I told you that story. But, um, yeah, she accidentally told Bob that my father-in-law died. <laughs> He's very much alive, so. Yeah. Anyway, children are great. <laughs> Other... Uh, Things that stand out to you in this? Other questions you have about this passage? Yeah, Chrissy. I was just going to say, in other places, we hear how hard it is to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. like, we're cast in an iron needle. Mm -hmm. And then I love that all we have to do is give one cup of cold water to a little one, right? Sure. Heaven, but I just wanted to kind of balance that yes. out in my mind. Yeah, so the interesting, uh, that's a very good distinction. The interesting dichotomy between those two passages is when Jesus is saying it's more difficult for uh, a rich man to enter heaven than it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. He's talking about attachment to wealth. Here, he's just talked about total detachment. 
And so right after that, if you are a disciple, totally detached, then all it takes is those small gestures. But if you have those earthly attachments to wealth, to riches, that's when it becomes very difficult, right? So think about okay, like cold water. Like we all have access to it, right? Hopefully. It's, it doesn't seem something terribly difficult. And even at the time of Jesus, this was a very simple thing to offer. And so think about that. Like think about the small things that you do each day that God sees. God sees every small act that you do of love for others, for yourself, for the kingdom. He sees it all. And if you like doubt yourself because you think like, oh, I have to be like this great evangelist. I have to go travel across the world like Mother Teresa or I have to lay down my life for someone like St. Max Maximilian Kolbe or whoever it may be. I mean, remember also the way of St. Therese, like do small things with great love, small acts of kindness, small opportunities to make the love of God known. The little way. God sees all of that. And so it doesn't always take a big, gigantic gesture to follow Jesus. In fact, I think the more common way we follow Jesus is these small, intentional acts of love and self-sacrifice every single day. And eventually those small things add up to something massive. I don't know if you've ever watched one of those like Lego, Lego assembly videos and they build these pieces and then they start building similar ones and they start assume, assembling them all together and they make bigger and bigger and bigger shapes. And it's very mathematical the way they like kind of film it, the way they assemble it. And it starts out with like this tiny little piece. And over and over again, each day, those tiny little acts, they conglomerate together and they make this beautiful gift of a sacrificial life for the Lord. So it doesn't have to be this big, huge, audacious thing. Or maybe you're struggling to follow Jesus. Maybe you're really battling like a habitual sin or some kind of obstacle in your life. It doesn't take this huge like, all right, I need to like throw out all my possessions and go be a hermit in the desert. Sometimes it just says like, okay, today I'm going to be a little better at fasting or having self-control at this. And I'm going to really focus on doing that for the next 10 minutes. And then you survive those 10 minutes and then you commit, okay, the next 10 minutes. You know, I think sometimes we get really discouraged by our sins and our vices because we think like, okay, today's the day I'm never going to do this again. And like for the rest of your life is a large goal. So maybe say for the rest of this hour, I'm never going to do this again. And when you meet that goal, give yourself a pat on the back and then set another goal for another hour. And then we can do that without thinking a few hours, a half a day, a full day, like really strive. Because if all of your energy, attention and focus is, is on that present, very real goal that you can achieve by the end of the day or the end of the week, then it's going to be so much easier to overcome the things that are going on in your life. So much easier to follow Jesus than we paint this huge picture of we have to be this great saint in our lives. And we have to do all these incredible big acts that need to be remembered, you know, year after year for generations. No, small acts of great love. The little Lego piece assembling another one each and every single day. That's what Jesus is asking for here. Simple hospitality. A simple gift, the smallest, easiest thing that you could give. But the interesting thing about a small cup of cold water is that we all have access to it. It doesn't seem that you know, important. But if you're a disciple who's been traveling for days and your water canteen is empty and it's hot and you're carrying all of your possessions on your back, a cup of cold water is your salvation. And so even in the small things that we do, God can make and bring out of them these abundant blessings. That's why when we extend hospitality to the prophet, to the righteous man, to the disciple, we by extension receive that reward and that blessing because even our small acts, our small efforts of sacrifice and service, God makes more abundant. He amplifies them. That's the beauty of the life of a disciple. We're always looking at what can I give away? And it always returns to us tenfold. But if we're looking at the life of disciple, about what can I achieve, what can I do, what can I get, then we're constantly going to feel like the well is running dry because we're only focused on how we're being poured into and not how we're pouring out. Other things stand out in this. Greg. I know from this gospel, <clears throat> I guess Jesus is talking to his disciples and saying, uh, like about your behavior, what you have to do. Mm -hmm. One thing was like, you know, even the pagans are nice to each other. 
Yes. I don't know exactly, but like even non believers do things that you do which you think are so great or whatever. Yeah. So you try to do more than that. Yeah. So I just thought it was interesting that he mentions these different people in here. And I assume they're Jewish, you know, but I mean, um, there's nothing in the of the very end when he talks about the little ones that you talked about before as the quote disciples. Mm -hmm. None of the people above that necessarily have to be disciples. Well, the person's Jewish, his parents are pagan. What about the parents? Like, I mean, the fact that he, he's saying, okay, like, well, okay, I'm kind of getting Okay, but whoever loves father and mother more than me is not believing me. It's the fact that he's talking about all these people, the, the family, mm -hmm. and the righteous man, and other people, but he's not necessarily saying that they, those people are his disciples. That Correct. They're getting ahead of him. It could be anyone. Yes, yeah. I mean, I don't know why anyone would seek to put Jesus before all those things if they weren't trying to follow him, which means they would by definition be a disciple or on the road to being a disciple. So in this sense, as we're interpreting it, we're not just talking about disciple in terms of the 12 or the people who are physically following Jesus at this time. We're interpreting it also through the lens of a disciple in today's day and age means anyone seeking to follow Jesus. Anyone. And so if anyone's seeking to follow Jesus, they will naturally want to do these things. No one is going to go out of their way to disconnect from family, father, mother, son, daughter, and follow Jesus if they're not seeking to be Christian or Christian already. So, and it's, again, as the Catechism says, that family relationships are important, important, but they're not, what is the word that it used? Absolute, yes, thank you. They're not absolute. They don't fulfill us in every way. I, I mean, as a parent, I'll be the first person to tell you I'm not perfect. And my children will probably be the second people to tell you that because I'm constantly asking for their forgiveness and apologizing and helping them see that like, yes, they can come to me for what they need, but ultimately they need to go to the Lord. They need to go to God because he has all the answers. He is the one who's going to fulfill them. He's the one who's never going to let them down. I will let them down constantly. I will. I'm not perfect. And so the more I can admit that and help them walk in that way, the better. It doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to our family to care for them, to care for our elderly parents, to care for our children. doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility to evangelize. I, in fact, I would say your first responsibility as an evangelist is to evangelize your family because they're the first group of people Jesus introduced you to. So they're first on the list by extension. He put you in that family for a reason. And so if there are people in your family that need to be evangelized, that's your first to-do list as an evangelist, as someone who's trying to be a prophet, trying to be righteous, is to try and evangelize in the way that you can. And yeah, that's why Jesus says in the Gospels, I did not come to bring peace, but division, to divide father against son and mother against daughter. Not because he wants to break up families, because he knows that ultimately every single person is going to have to make a decision about him. And so that decision trumps every other relationship. And so if the decision to follow Jesus means that there's discord in our family, so be it. We try and remedy that, we try and be charitable and compassionate, but it doesn't mean we forsake Jesus as Lord of our lives or hide from that out of a desire to appease our family or not to make things uncomfortable. You know what would be really uncomfortable? If you're in heaven and your entire family's in hell. I think that would be more uncomfortable than like a conversation or two. It's just my opinion, one guy's opinion. But that would be pretty uncomfortable, especially at my judgment facing Jesus. You know, I see here in my book that your family's not on the list. I wonder who knew them the best and who had the prime responsibility to tell them about me. My Jesus is a little sassy. <laughs> yeah. He'd probably be more compassionate than that. But, you know. But really, like that's, that's our responsibility. That's our goal. Where God has placed you. Setting aside all other attachments, all of their desires to keep everything comfortable, not ruffle any feathers, not shove our faith down other people's throats. I hate that phrase. Nobody is like, believe, you know, like it's not a good evangelization technique anyway. But we can't use that as an excuse to not even talk about it. That's our responsibility. Other things that stand out to you? Other questions you have? Matt. Verse 41, the 
verb receives, he receives a prophet, so he is a prophet, and then he receives a righteous man. You're um, discussing what it actually meant to receive a prophet and what it means to receive a righteous man. Mm. What does it mean to receive another person? Um, so at this time, the idea of radical hospitality was very apparent culturally at the time of Jesus, especially, and it still is in this part of the world in many places that you go. I mean, there, there's, if you have ever been to an Eastern Catholic rite, so go to a Maronite Catholic Mass, for example, or a Melkite Catholic Mass, or a Syro Malabar Catholic Mass, the Catholics are brothers and sisters from India. They all have different communities in Orange County. You can go to almost every Eastern rite, at least every major one in Orange County. And let me tell you, the spread that they lay out and the hospitality they extend, even to strangers, is incredible. Like after every, I mean, everyone comes from like hours away because there's so much, so far fewer of these churches everywhere to experience mass in the way that their cultural right allows them to. And then they have this beautiful uh, gift of hospitality. And everyone they receive, they receive as if they are an emissary of Christ. I mean, that's really what this means to receive someone. If you're receiving a message or, you know, let's say in medieval terms, if you're, you're receiving a steward of the king, it was up to you to treat that steward as if they were the king himself. And so the same responsibility is extended to us, except it doesn't apply just to any important person in the church. It applies to every single person because Jesus dwells in all of us especially those of us who are baptized, to extend that hospitality because in every single person, Jesus is dwelling. In the Old Testament, when Abraham, he runs out to greet the three strangers and to make them something to eat, it was because there was an expectation that when you encounter the stranger, that the presence of God was in them and God was going to reveal something or bless you in some way through the stranger. And I think we've lost that, right? When I was growing up, when a car pulled into our driveway or when someone knocked at our door, we got excited. And then I became a teenager, a young adult, and when someone pulled in our driveway or knocked on our door, it was like, turn off all the lights and hide. Who is this? Everyone protect yourselves, grab a weapon. You know, it was like, what's going on? My dad would peer out the blinds, like, who's turning around in our driveway? We had a big circular dirt driveway. And so it was just like, you know, it all of a sudden became contentious, you know? And it reminds me, uh, there's a quote by C.S. Lewis that goes something like, Next to the blessed sacrament, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. Next to the blessed sacrament, the Eucharist, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. That's from C.S. Lewis, who wasn't even Catholic. I mean, he was like so close, but he wasn't. Maybe, maybe at the end of his life. But our neighbor, how do we extend that hospitality to one another? So often I hear people say, you know, I don't know where Jesus is. I can't find him. I don't hear Jesus speaking. And sometimes I just want to say, well, let me introduce him to you. He's everywhere in all of these people. Go talk to him. Go meet him. Go serve him. Go welcome him into your home. And when we have this very self-focused, like, perspective, it's all about, like, how do people view me? What can I get from this person? Do I want to be friends with this person? Instead of thinking about, oh, that person's new here. I've never seen them before. Maybe I should invite them over to my house for lunch or take them out to coffee and get to know them because Christ dwells in them. And I know by extending that hospitality, by receiving them, I will receive a blessing because Christ in them is receiving me. That's the beauty of a life of a disciple. That Jesus is our first priority. And not only that, he is everywhere in everyone. Impossible not to encounter, but so easy to create obstacles in front of us. And our culture is just getting more and more and more individualized, self-focused, and breaking down all the barriers to real authentic human connection to where you can have thousands of friends and followers online and feel like the loneliest person in the world. And that's today's mental health crisis with our young people who are so addicted to the algorithms that make them addicted on their phones to social media, and some of us too maybe, that we spend so much time thinking we're in relationship with people on a screen, presenting a false self or an anonymous self online that nobody really knows us. And it's not a far leap then from that place to see why so many young people are taking their own lives because it's easy to then see nobody really knows the real me. 
because I have this obstacle of a rectangular screen in front of me constantly. Nobody can see me, and I won't let anyone see me. I won't see anybody else. So how are those things affecting you and I? That, to me, is the real challenge of this gospel this week. You know, in the first reading, you're going to hear a story of um, the prophet Elisha. And you may have heard the story. It's uh, part of the story of Elisha um, and the Shumanite woman. And the Shumanite woman is infertile, and she wants to have a son. And she extends hospitality to Elisha. She builds kind of a house for him on her roof because he keeps passing through the area. And he has his servant ask her, um, what can we do for you? And she says, well, I've been without a child. That's all I've ever wanted. And he says, when I come back this time next year, you'll have a child. And he extends that hospitality to her. And so it's a beautiful kind of precursor to the gospel because first, it shows that if you extend hospitality, it re results in supernatural and abundant blessing in your life. But what it also reveals is, even though this woman was given the gift of a son, the gift isn't about just the son. It's about the Father in heaven who gave the son. You know, my daughter comes to me and says, Dad, I'm so hungry. I need food. Can you please bless me with food? And I give my daughter something to eat. And if she starts worshiping Cheez-Its on some golden altar, she's like lost all sense of reality. Like, I am the one. I am the father who gave it to her. It should strengthen our relationship and her ability to know that she can come to me and that I will provide for her. It's not about the gift. It's not about what we receive. It's about who we are receiving and who we are going to when we receive someone else. That's what this gospel is about. That's what it means to be a disciple, what it means to go out on mission, to preach the gospel to all nations. That's why Jesus ends this great missionary discourse after all the things he's talked about, having courage under persecution, sending the 12 out on mission, telling them to go without money, without sack, without an extra tunic, to go out radically trusting in the Lord. He ends with this, complete detachment from everything. Christianity is simple. It will cost you no less than everything. Other things? We've got about 10 minutes. Other questions? Other things stand out? Things you're curious about from this passage? Yes. Uh, I don't know the timeline with Matthew, but it seemed to me that right after this he says that you know, Jesus finished his instruction, so the last few chapters were about really, and maybe they're for other people because Matthew wrote this later, but sure. the point that was being made was that Jesus wanted those 12 that were new Jesus just going to uh, go the other way to really understand what it meant to be his disciple. Mm. And that this is how intense it was going to be. It is not necessarily designed for us now in the same way it was designed for them at the time. Mm. Is that this, this, that, this is the last instruction and then after that, John the, John the Baptist is still alive, so he moves on. And I don't know whether how chronological Matthew is, but this, this sounds like it is near his death, but then the way it's phrased, it sounds early, because John the Baptist is right around him. That yes. Early. So yeah. I, I looked at this as, as Jesus' teaching moments that happen to be useful for us to understand now, Mm -hmm. but we're mostly, with this type of language, direct to those 12. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I would have a different opinion. Um, I think that the missionary, because it's a missionary, whole missionary discourse, not just directed to the 12. He continues teaching after he sends them out, and it continues to extrapolate on what he means even after he receives them back to the crowds that are around him in Galilee, not just to the 12. So it's clear he's teaching to more than just them during the course of this chapter. Um, and then this is just in Matthew. Matthew arranges the teachings of Jesus in five sections. This is only the second one. So the first one is a Sermon on the Mount. This is the second one, the missionary discourse. And then he has a parable discourse. So all the parables in Matthew are there, which are huge teaching moments. Um, then he has the discourse on church order. How are you to organize as a church, which is paramount instruction for the disciples themselves but still influences us today to see our role in the church. And then he has finally what's called the eschatological discourse, which is all about what's going to happen at the end of time. And so I don't think it's anywhere close to the end of his teaching because he has three more teaching discourses um, throughout the course of Matthew. And whether or not Matthew presents everything chronologically, 
Um, he's pretty similar to Luke. Luke, I would argue, is the most chronological uh, because of how he investigates and presents the gospel of Jesus. Uh, Matthew rearranges certain things, but only around certain feasts in the Jewish calendar year to be able to further emphasize some kind of symbolism or allegory Jesus is making with a particular teaching. So for instance, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, it's during a particular feast, I believe the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Booths, where these two giant lampstands are lit in the temple area and Jerusalem is up on a hill. And so Jerusalem looks like the light of the world. Jesus stands in the temple area and he says, I am the light of the world. So Matthew presents these certain moments a little bit out of chronology to show exactly the gravity of what Jesus is saying when he's using certain words. But it's not so achronological that I think we could you know, argue that it's happening toward the end because every gospel has some kind of discourse on the last things, the end of times. Um, that's how most of them culminate. And this one is not close to that yet. But that's an interesting point. I yeah. just thought it because he was instructing them and he wanted them to know that he really meant it. Yeah, oh, sure. Because they were the ones who were being taken away from their families. Yeah. Not necessarily the 5,000 people in the crowd. Yeah. Yeah. Well, eventually, very quickly, especially to the, the time where Matthew's actually writing this, 20 to 25 years after Jesus has re resurrected, every Christian is on the chopping block, not just those in the church hierarchy. If you profess the name of Jesus, you have a death sentence waiting for you. So it may have been very focused on them in the beginning, but I think anyone reading this when it was written would have understood its extension to the entire church and by extension to all of us today. Yeah, that's a great point. I never thought about that before. Any final thoughts? Questions? Threats? No? Jerry, the thread, please. No. <laughs> so, uh, the, actually, the, the word cold did not uh, just stick out to me, but were they getting that mainly from like wells or like streams? I would assume so, yeah. Um, well, either. Um, yeah, anywhere that's out of, you know, exposure to sunlight. So this does imply that there's some kind of effort, you know, being taken, that you're giving them, you're not giving them some water that's been sitting out and has come to room temperature or adjusted to the hot weather outside, uh, but you are going and giving them, you know, from your fresh draw from the well that you've been keeping cool in your house or going to the local spring and getting them something fresh, you know. So it does imply effort. This isn't to say, like, okay, you just have to do like little baby tasks that are unnoticeable and that nobody would really bat an eye at and you're going to get to heaven. That is a really bad way to interpret this passage. Um, Jesus himself says like the way is narrow and few are taking it. Like it's a hard to traverse journey, not because we have to do a lot to get there. It's because of how much we have to let go of, how much we have to give up. Because think about it, like if it was all about what you can do, then any person who was mentally ill, disabled, too young, too old, incapable of doing some of these things we mainly associate with like the Christian life, then so many people would be disqualified from heaven because it would be a resume. It would be a to-do list. It'd be like, you have to do these certain things. And if you're incapable, sorry, do not pass go, go straight to hell, do not collect $200. And that would not be in line with the ministry and teaching of Jesus. Jesus does not expect us to do anything before we let go of everything. And ironically, in the radical upside down nature of Jesus's teaching, those groups that I mentioned already are very easily inclined to let go of everything. Children, the disabled, the mentally ill, the, the uh, extremely elderly who do not have the ability to care for themselves, all of those groups of people, they're used to not being able to be in control. That's why they're so close to the kingdom because they don't have these earthly attachments. Just as, John, or as um, Jesus says to Peter in the Gospel of John 21, he says, one day you will be led where you do not want to go and other people will dress you. You have to prepare for the fact that one day you are going to have a fate and a life where you're not going to be in control. Are you prepared for that? Because that's the journey of a disciple. That's what Christianity means. To live a life where you are not in control. And that's hard. Because we live in a society that is primed to create control freaks. Everything has an app. You know, everything has an ability to track, log, control. Christian life is not like that. And so it can be very challenging. That's why the way is narrow. That's why fewer are on it. 
not because there's so much we need to do, but because there's so much we need to let go of. And most of us just aren't ready to do that. On Thursday, if you um, happen to follow the podcast that I record, uh, I recorded an episode today on the second reading, and it kind of uh, plays into this. If you've ever read the story The Great Divorce, there's a scene in The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. Uh, it's not about divorce. It's about uh, heaven, hell, and purgatory. And there's a scene in The Great Divorce where there is a little lizard on the shoulder of a soul who is trying to, get to, to see if he wants to go to heaven. And he won't like give up this lizard, which represents his sin. This is very interesting interaction. So I read that section on that episode of the podcast. So uh, if you're curious about that, it's Mana Food for Thought is the name of the podcast. You can probably find it in my email signature. Um, if you've never listened to it before, I don't like self-promoting, but I just happened to record that today. And it's very pertinent. It keeps coming up in my mind, but I don't want to just say it because I already said it. <laughs> and you can hear it on Thursday. So, um, but that's a little uh, part two uh, that you can have in store for you. But for those of us uh, who are here tonight and just want to receive this gospel and how it's related to the first reading, all the ways that God wants to provide for us, all the ways that God blesses us, all the things that God has in store for us doesn't require this massive, huge, life-altering, transformative, saintly effort all at once. Small acts of service, small acts of great love, small, good, virtuous choices every day. That's what will get us there. And it's not about the laundry list of things that we do. I can't tell you how many times conversations I've had at this parish where people come up to me and the conversation is clear they don't like something that I'm doing or don't like me. And the conversation starts with, I have a brick that I bought that's over there. And I'm like, I could care less about your stinking brick. Like, thanks for giving the church money and building it. But like, good for you. Like, bring it up in your judgment. See what Jesus says. Like, you know, I'm much more charitable in the moment, but like, it's just like, that was a great thing to do, but like bringing it up constantly, like, come on. So it's just this kind of sense of like, it's all about what I do. It's about the amount of money that I give. No. Are you willing to let go of that? Are you willing to let go? Of oh, I can't tell you how many times someone has come at me with a brick conversation. You know, not a physical brick, but like, yeah, I don't have enough digits to count. Anyway, thank you for being here. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for this time and for this community. Thank you for the ways that this gospel has challenged us to grow in our relationship with you and to let go of all the things that get in the way of that relationship. Help us to think about the people you've placed before us. Help us to think about the small acts that we can do each day with great love, small acts of virtue, and to not think in terms of the grand scheme of our life or these big, great missions, unless you call us to them, Lord. But those missions are cultivated in small acts of saying yes each day and being faithful to you as you are always faithful to us. So help us to remember that Christianity is a simple condition. It costs no less than everything. To let go of all those things and recognize that you are our first and only priority, and that is the only recipe to a completely fulfilled and joyful life. And if we're looking for you, we can find you in the Blessed Sacrament, but if not there, our neighbor is the holiest object presented to our senses. So help us to be more focused on others and how we can serve, receive others, to be hospitable, and to think less of ourselves. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks so much.